Welcome back to The Issue Is. Great to be back with you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you Appreciate so much. Um, this week, another week, more fires. Wow. It seems almost like whack-a-mole in terms of dealing with these fires. Wow. I know we both want to give a shout out to our first responders. No who question. Doing such great you know, I was with them all week in the middle of the night. I saw folks who are the heroes on the line. And I know a lot of people want to be back in their homes. They wanted to be back in their homes, too, but they did an incredible job this week. So let's talk, though, about one of the big issues that's come out recently mm. is this question about power yeah. uh, and some of these power lines that right. may or may not have sparked some of these fires mm -hmm. in the past. Northern California has done a lot of wide-scale power right. outages. We haven't seen that quite as much here in Southern California. Right. What do we do about these power lines that, in, yeah. in some cases, are starting these fires? Well, my heart goes out to Northern Californians who have to deal with this. We're very lucky in the city of Los Angeles because the Department of Water and Power we have about 485 square miles compared with 20 or 40,000 square miles for PG&E and for Southern California Edison. So in the city, we're re reasonably well protected. We don't have to do those proactive uh, outages, and we've kept people's power on, even in Brentwood and Pacific Palisades this week during the Getty fire. Uh, that said, you know, the state has no direct power. These decisions are completely made by the executives of these independent um, utilities. So I can tell the DWPP folks what to do, keep power on or not, listen to their suggestions. The governor and the legislature are literally, no pun intended, powerless to do anything. And so, you know, we, I think, have to look at some changes in state law. And we have to remember, too, just throwing the liability onto these private utilities, we're all pissed off at them in places like Northern California. But that comes back in your rates. They may see a doubling of their rates just to deal with the fire liability up there. Uh, another, of course, big issue, sort of the biggest issue that you deal with these yeah. days is homelessness. Absolutely. Of course, a few years ago, you asked voters to pass uh, Proposition HHH. Yes. -H. This is a billion dollars mm -hmm. to build 10,000 affordable housing yep. units. Uh, the controller came out with a report that mm -hmm. said that zero units have been built mm -hmm. and said that the average cost per unit mm -hmm. is something like $530,000. Mm -hmm. yeah. How is that okay? How is that acceptable? So two things. One, we have um, over 1,200 units that have been built of supportive housing since that passed. But people know when you pass a new thing, to build something takes probably two to two and a half years. Um, these are permanent apartments. These aren't the shelters which we're popping up now every 60 days or so. We're able to get a new one up and by the end of the year we'll have 2,000 beds worth of shelters. But the 10,000 apartments, which will actually we think we're going to get to about 13,000 bedrooms worth of permanent housing. This is housing that comes also with support. So you can't just look at the price of an apartment. They sometimes have mental health care. Uh, they have substance abuse centers in them. They will have child care. So if you divide that whole building by 50 units, you get a price. But the units themselves are cheaper. That said, I want to reassure taxpayers, we're only subsidizing about 150000 of that 500000 That's market rate to build anything. It's a strong economy, so labor costs more. Our tariffs have made steel go up. So where's the rest of the money come from? If, if if that's, that's the more important question. I'm not worried that we will meet our goals and deliver exactly what we told taxpayers we do over a decade. We'll probably do it five years early. That said, when that money runs out, we're going to need a second infusion because there's no question L.A. now has the model. Uh, in fact, in Washington, D.C., at a recent conference, they said, we're the model for how you deal with homelessness. We've gone from 9,000 to 21,000 people housed a year. But you and I look on the streets. To me, this is something getting worse. Yeah. At a well, not only to, to, to us. I mean, the, the statistics point out right. the fact that it's getting it worse. The homeless count show that we're up. So how is the L.A. the model if well, the homeless count is going right, up? Because I, I had the same feeling. And I remind people, the city has very little power compared to what the county, state, and federal government has for affordable housing, mental health care, hospitals. None of that's in the city. I've got cops and street cleaners, and you can't clean or arrest your way out of this solely. But the reason it's the model is because we've been able to, like I said, not only go from 9,000, but to 21,000 people a year that we are housing. The problem is we probably need even more resources. The federal government's cut by 80% its affordable housing over the last decade, and the state obliterated redevelopment, which was the money that we used. Just if we had that money that we had 10 years ago, mm -hmm. I could have built 40,000 more units of housing. When you th think about the number of people on the street, that is equal to the number of people on the streets today. But we look at like these fires this week, right? Mm -hmm. And you're able to put up temporary shelters in a matter of hours mm -hmm. and have all these people come yep. there. Why can't something like that happen for homelessness? Why isn't some of these abandoned government buildings yeah. turned into these shelters to just get yeah. the people off the street? It's exactly what we're doing. There's two, two problems. One is you have to make sure people go there. The, yeah. Under our Constitution, you can't force people to go. But we are very successful in building a much better model. If you just pop up a tent someplace, People maybe go for a day or two. If you say you can only spend the night there and you can't bring your partner, your pet, your property, they don't go. But what we are doing is called a bridge home. 
They are these facilities we have now in Hollywood. We have one going up in the valley. We've got, by the end of the year, we'll have 26 of them. They're being built in as, uh, as little as 60 days. Mm -hmm. And what they have is a permanent place you can go while we're getting a permanent apartment for you. That is working and that's why it's the model. And if the federal government doesn't look at this as a national problem, especially around mental health care, we're just going to be cleaning up behind. So you need President Trump's help on this? Absolutely. And when he brought it up, I know a lot of Democrats wanted me just to punch him back. I said any day that the president and the commander in chief is talking about homelessness is a good day, wrote him a letter, told him five things he could do tomorrow to help us if he really wants to clean up the streets and I hope that he will. And has he done any of them? Not yet. Okay. All right. Let's talk about the issue of presidential politics. Yes. Last time you were here, you were like this close from announcing that you were going to run. <laughs> so many of us thought that you were going to right. run for president. You decided not to run for president. Right. You've sort of played this role where all the different candidates come here and you end up hosting all of them kind of as an mm -hmm. agnostic in the yep. process, right. trying to advocate for L.A. Um, but when you watch those debates, there's yeah. got to be part of you that thinks, I could say this, I could do this, I could compete with these guys. Isn't there just a little part of you that feels that way? Not really. It was the easiest really? decision of my life. I mean, I have the dream job in a place that I love where my city and my family are. Imagine during the fires this week if I was in Iowa. That would rip me apart as a mayor and as, a, as an Angelino. Vice versa, if I was here during some emergency when I could be at a steak fry talking about you know, winning the, the presidency, I couldn't do both, and that was an easy decision to make. Um, we like to play some games here, and I like that you're yes. always game and you take definitive always. positions. Not so, playing the piano, though, tonight, uh, right? We're not doing that today, <laughs> but we are uh, playing a game called Either Or because we are in a, a sort of a grand time in L.A. sports, yes. right? Yes. So many exciting things. So this is an Either Or between L.A. sports edition. All Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Let's so do you it. you got to root for one team. Is it the Rams or the Chargers? Rams. Thank you, Chargers, for the help with our summer youth yeah. programs. But Rams, for sure. Lakers or Clippers? As I always say to Doc Rivers, a friend, I root for the Clippers every time they play, unless they're playing the Lakers. Lakers till I die. There you go. LAFC or Galaxy? Galaxy did an amazing job, but you know LAFC plays in the city of LA, and this year broke every record. I was there rooting them on all year long. LAFC. You were going to say you were the Falconer for one of their games. Exactly. Uh, Dodgers or Angels? Come on. You even well, have to ask. They Although, are the LA I Angels I, I of Anaheim. I don't mind anybody calling themselves the Angels. They could be the LA Angels, uh, LA Yankees of New York, and yeah. I do them on. But <laughs> the Dodgers, the Dodgers, Dodgers, and, and we're coming back. And finally, USC or UCLA? Uh, my dad raised me. It's UC, USC for football and UCLA for basketball. Oh, that's a safe spot. And ah, if, you, yeah. if you were at UCLA this he week, he went to both. That's why you were at UCLA this week talking to the inventors of the internet. First email was sent from LA to. Silicon Valley in Stanford. People didn't know that. Uh, this is the pin, actually, 50 years. A guy named Len Kleinrock. I gave him the key to the city. He literally sent the first email from something that's half the size of this wall. Wow. You know, even as a Trojan, I just gave some love to UCLA. All right, we're going to play one you. more you're, game. You're it's, called, it's called Personal Issues. This yes. is where we put 30 seconds on the clock, uh -huh. get to know you a little bit okay. better. Some fun questions. Okay, here we go. Uh, we start off with favorite Halloween candy. Uh, probably Twix. Favorite actor or actress? Uh, let's see, probably George Clooney. Favorite athlete? Favorite athlete? Uh, these days, I gotta say, well, for, forever Kareem. And okay. James Worthy is a close second. Uh, who's your role model? Role model is probably um, either my father or a woman named Boga Gebre, who's an Ethiopian activist. Favorite Republican? Favorite Republican right now? Yeah. Alive? Yeah. Uh, um, probably Tom Tate, the former mayor of Anaheim. Oh, yes. You guys work closely together. And I've awesome. interviewed the two of you He's together a, a few times over Absolutely. the years. Well, last time that you were here, you referenced this. Uh, you played the piano for us. Right. Uh, so we want to show some of that, which was pretty amazing. We surprised you with the piano, and you came up with this like classic song that you had just like created yourself, which was amazing. Yeah. So uh, I played a Taste of Soul a couple weeks ago. Too. Since then, though, uh -huh. you've moved on to bigger and better things. We've got some video of you at the L.A. Philharmonic oh, boy. playing with Gustavo Dudamel and Moby and a choir. I mean, this is amazing. What, what was going through your mind for this process? Um, well, Moby asked if I would play. I love his music. Um, it was my Philharmonic debut, and my mom, I got in huge trouble. Jewish mother, she's like, you played the Philharmonic and you didn't tell me, but I had like two days notice. Huh. I came by to the practice a couple hours before and then he let me play the last song with him. It was the experience of a lifetime. I've been in the audience so many times. I was nervous from the stage, but um, Moby was amazing. Well, you're a maestro who's learned every lesson, but you have not learned the lesson, don't upset your Jewish mother. I know, exactly. <laughs> She's not like a stereotypical one, but I told her, next time, Mom, I'll call you ahead of time. Yeah, well, nice job there. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you so much for always coming. We always appreciate you. the appreciate time. You too. Mayor Thanks. Eric Garcetti, we go to Thanks. break with more of his music. <laughs> next, our panel joins us. Stay with us. You're watching The Issue Is.
Is it nerve wracking? Uh, you know. From Southern California to the Bay Area, you're watching The Issue Is. There's no question LA now has the model. Uh, in fact, in Washington, D.C., at a recent conference, they said, we're the model for how you deal with homelessness. We just moments ago, L.A. Mayor Eric Garcetti claiming that L.A. is the model for how to deal with homelessness around the country. But is it really? Let's talk about that and more with our panel. Our returning champ is Michael Knowles, also known as Beyonce Knowles. He hosts <laughs> the Michael Knowles Show on the Daily Wire. That's at 6.30 a.m. Pacific new time slot, Mondays through Thursday. Johanna Masca is the CEO of Global Situation Room, a communications consulting firm. From 2007 to 2015, she was in charge of press advance for President Barack Obama, coordinating his travel around the country and around the world. What an interesting job that must have been. Mm -hmm. Ethan Behrman is a syndicated radio talk show host. You can find his podcast and more about him at ethanbehrman.com. He's also the brave liberal who is a frequent guest on the Fox News channel, going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the hosts in prime time, and somehow he's survives that every week. <laughs> Good to see you. Welcome all. Welcome to you two for the first time on the show. Uh, Michael, as the returning champion, let's start with you. Is L.A. the model for how to deal with homelessness? To say that L.A. is the model for dealing with homelessness is to say that Krispy Kreme is the model for dealing with obesity. It is just <laughs> absurd. Over the past year alone, homelessness is up 13 percent in L.A. County. It's up 16 percent in L.A. City. There is nothing that we want to mimic about that around the country. Unfortunately, Mayor Garcetti, with all due respect to him, has utterly failed on this issue. It's been three years since they passed that $1.2 billion bond. Nothing has happened on it. It's true that the problem has cropped up around the country, but it's particularly bad in L.A. I think his point, Ethan, was that, he, that we are housing more people more successfully. The problem is that there's just more people that keep needing to be housed. Does he have a point, or is that sort of a strange a messaging? And, I mean, look, I'm originally from the Midwest where you freeze to death if you're unhoused at night. So people come here when they're looking for housing. We have kids who run away from abusive homes that are here in Los Angeles that need our care. I know people who are very involved with helping the homeless children. They come here because they can survive, because we do have services, because we don't just lock them up and throw away the key because we actually have compassion. So that is a major part of it. Yes, we need to be doing better. Yes, we need to bring that cost per unit of housing down. But absolutely, we are the place that's actually trying to do something about it. Your thoughts, Joy? I think if uh, LA was the model, uh, Mayor Garcetti would be running for president. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's not actually his fault, though. And so here's what I would say is that I grew up in Galesburg, Illinois, and we did have uh, quite a bit of homelessness because the mental health institution had been closed because of Reaganomics. And so this has now been continuation of our slash of our safety net for the least among us that we are seeing in LA, but actually we're seeing the rates rise even faster in Texas, in Arizona, and in um, uh, places around the country that are not Los Angeles because our rate is actually in California going down. Michael, I mean, that, that is one of the points that he made. Essentially, the, the federal government is not doing enough to help. The president talks about helping, but isn't doing that much to actually help. What do you sure. say to that? Well, to Joanna's point, Ronald Reagan hasn't been governor of California since 1975. He's been dead for 15 years. When are we going to stop blaming Ronald Reagan well, let's for the problems Well, let's talk about California? President Trump right now, though. I mean, Garcetti says he's asking for help and the president isn't doing anything. Sure. The, so, what Mayor Garcetti is saying is that we just need more money and we need to get it from the federal government to house more people. The trouble is that our homeless shelters are not being used as they are. There was a survey that went out. They only have a 78 percent utilization rate. There was a survey of the shelters. More than half of them are not full at capacity every single night. Why is that? Because to Joanna's point, there's a big problem with mental health in, in the homeless population. There's a big problem with drug addiction. That's what needs to be addressed. And any uh, is any way to address homelessness that does not deal with those problems and does not empower police officers to deal with those problems is going to fail. Ethan, you're shaking your head. Yeah, oddly, Michael and I have one area of agreement, and that is that the, 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 and the, the mental health is a major issue here that we have failed back to Reagan, and not a single Republican or Democratic governor has successfully addressed ever since. And it has to do with laws and how we can't just lock people up. So empowering police isn't the issue. We need a SWAT team of mental health professionals to go out and interact with homeless people and get them the mental health care they need in the short-term immediate care 
and on an ongoing basis to address the issue yeah. along yeah. with housing. You know, Last word. The, well, and this is the thing, is you bring up police. Police officers are not trained to deal with mental health issues, and they shouldn't be. They're supposed to protect us. They have enough job responsibilities as it is. And so I see this as a failure of our system, Republicans and Democrats, and we need to fix it. So let's see the solution. Don't you think mental health should be part of the process Absolutely. for police officers? What do you no, mean they shouldn't no. be trained they, to, to, I'm be, sorry, to deal with they, mental health? I'm sorry, but what ends up happening is because we aren't dealing with people who have mental health issues, we don't have all of the different services available, police end up having to be the ones called to these situations. We see it time and time yeah. again when they take violent action not knowing whether this person is a threat. Yeah. And they are not trained to deal with that. They shouldn't have to be the person who's dealing with mental health issues on our streets. Yeah. There should be a whole slew of solutions for that person before they get to the point of homelessness and the issues of their mental instability on the streets. Got it. We're going to have to leave it there. Uh, thank you so much. Up next, Katie Hill resigns from Congress. Should she have? And what's next for that district? More of the issue is right after this. That was something else of watching her this week. Cheers. Yeah, nicely Cheers. done. I'm leaving because of a misogynistic culture that gleefully consumed my naked pictures, capitalized on my sexuality, and enabled my abusive ex to continue that abuse this time with the entire country watching. Katie Hill resigns her seat in Congress, saying she's a victim of revenge porn. She admits to having an improper relationship with a member of her campaign staff. A right-wing website released naked photos of that relationship and apparently was threatening to release potentially hundreds more. Kill Hill was a rising star, one of our most frequent guests right here on The Issue Is. Let's talk about all this with our panel, Michael Knowles, Johanna Masca, and Ethan Bierman. Johanna, let's begin with you. Should she have resigned? Only Katie Hill knows what would have come out in this ethics investigation. I had to fill out an SF-86 when I went into the White House, and that's the background information. You have to list anything you've done that's blackmailable. And the reason why is because if you're blackmailable, you're not the best representative of America. And so she knows what would have come out in this investigation. Honestly, the fact that she had brought someone into what she's now saying is an abusive relationship, a third party, that shows a stunning lack of judgment, in my opinion. I think she clearly has some personal issues that she needs to deal with, but so too does Duncan Hunter. And this is the problem, is I think that we need to stand against this kind of behavior whether it's a Democrat or a Republican. And I'd like to see Republicans and Democrats come out against it. Duncan Hunter is a member of Congress who is a Republican who has been indicted. His wife has admitted to some improper behavior, yet he continues uh, to run for re-election for people that don't yeah, aren't following was just that. Yeah. And was just re-elected at that in the 2018 yeah. campaign after all this it had come up with five affairs. Look, here's the problem that we run into. There really is a double standard when it comes to women versus men. Naked pictures of a woman is much more... Uh, titillating apparently to many on the right in particular there's a misogyny that is applied here because men 50 percent roughly I went back and, and read through all the sex scandals of the last 20 years it's about 50 percent of men on the right who resign some of them have to be run out some of them are to hold their office women it's instant it's it's over there's no, there's no hanging around Democrats resign so there is a double standard both on the political side and on the gender but side Ethan to push back on that a little bit if there was a naked photo of a male politician with a 22 year old campaign staffer brushing her hair or a naked picture with a bong don't you think that the media would cover that too uh, no because we have a sitting president who has upwards of 43 accusations of sexual assault abuse rape that has happened and it just gets brushed aside but, and we now have videographic but, but, evidence with Jeffrey Epstein but, of him sexually abusing a woman right there on camera. But he's dead now. I mean, but what about like Epstein Anthony Weiner? That sort of brought him down, didn't it? It did. And again, another Democrat. So Democrats get held fully to the standard. Yeah. Republicans, it's eh, maybe. Okay, but then he's a, a male Democrat. Michael, right. let's get you in on this. You know, I'm not that old, but I am old enough to have lived through the Clinton administration. So I'm not quite sure that uh, the Democrats take sex scandals all that hard in the United States. This question is a question of judgment. Joanne, I think your point is absolutely right. It's not just the sex scandal, though it was a bizarre sex scandal. She's cheating and exploiting a 22-year-old young staffer with her husband. Then she dumps both of them to cheat with a male staffer. That's why We don't know that. She denies, allegedly, she denies allegedly. that. Allegedly. There are a lot of allegations. Yeah. According to 
uh, the, uh, her initial defense of this, that she was being targeted because of her sexuality, her husband then came out and said, this isn't about your sexuality, you're leaving us for a man. We'll see what happens in, as those allegations get sorted out. So then the second defense was revenge porn. The real issue is judgment. What sort of public servant would allow themselves to have all of these photos taken? This is absolutely bizarre behavior, an egregious ethical violation, and an egregious lack of judgment from this congressman, and of course, she should resign But, but it. isn't it also revenge porn? and isn't that also wrong? Well, so it was funny. I was looking up the different uh, photos that had come out, naked photos of uh, Congress people, just to have some perspective. And it's interesting that the women tend to have pictures taken of them, and the men tend to take their own picture and send it out, which is super <laughs> disturbing on like every level. So, you know, I, I don't know what that says about uh, men and women, yeah. but I think the bottom line is... When you are re representing America, I think you need to have your own house in order before you go to the House. And I think that's true if you're a Democrat or a Republican, and that's what Americans want. And, and Ethan, going, going forward in this district now, because this was a seat that was Republican for many years, Katie Hill was able to flip it. Where do you see this race going, going forward? Yeah, I think the Democrats have a, have a great replacement. I'm going to mess her name up right now. Stark, I believe, is, is what her name is. Christy Smith. Chris Smith. Thank you, Christy yeah. Smith. Yeah. I, so She's got to work on her name ID. I, right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the that is a placeholder name because yeah. it's uh, but Christy Smith is an excellent candidate. She immediately went after George Papadopoulos, who has he doesn't even know where California yeah. 25 is. I think that's bizarre that a convicted felon is going to be running, or I don't know if that's a felony that he was he was convicted of lying, which is a felony, excuse me. Yeah. So he's gonna try running for that seat. Uh, I think I think the Democrats keep it. Well, there's also a former congressman, Steve Knight, who held that seat before running for it as well. I'm sorry to say I think that the, the days of that Republican seat are over. I think that, unfortunately, the whole state is trending blue. And uh, even with this egregious sex scandal, drug scandal, judgment scandal, I think the Democrats probably hold it. Although maybe if people listen to the Michael Knowles That's show, what I keep start telling to people. the other direction, right? <laughs> All right. Uh, well, we have uh, a new podcast we want to tell you about. We're sitting down with Johanna. Who uh, has lots of fascinating stories of coordinating all the press travel for almost the entire Obama administration? It's unique insight on how the presidency actually works. You can download all of our past shows in podcast form. Just search for The Issue Is wherever you stream. Coming up next, will President Trump be rescued by Republicans in the Senate? Does he need to be? We're talking impeachment and a little Halloween, too, when we come back. <laughs> On this vote, the yeas are 232, the nays are 196. This week, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi presided over a formal vote of the House establishing an impeachment inquiry into the president. It's looking increasingly like the president will be impeached in the House, but is there any chance Republicans in the Senate can be convinced to turn on him? Back with our panel, Michael Knowles, Johanna Masca, and Ethan Bierman. Ethan, let's start with you. It's just a question of will they operate on principle or do they serve their party first? It really is that easy. Um, I don't think, though, that the Senate is going to vote. I don't think they're going to impeach the president. And so then we are in a situation where it may very well energize his base. And I think Democrats need to tread very carefully here. No, they're not going to do it. This is an impeachment in search of a crime. They've tried to do it since before he took office. First it was Russia, then it was Stormy Daniels, then it was the taxes, now it's Ukraine. I think it's going to be a loser issue for Democrats, especially as more about the whistleblower and his relationship to Joe Biden comes out. And I think as Representative Democrat Al Green said, Democrats believe that if they don't impeach him, they will lose in 2020, and that's why they're pushing for it. All right, well, one thing that brings uh, the country together, not the impeachment issue, but Halloween. That's something uh, a lot of fun this week week showcase and Ethan I know you you went out with your kids right absolutely trick-or-treating is the best thing in the world and that picture right there is my son Levi is just the best big brother and he's helping uh, my daughter Shiloh put on her makeup for her Chucky costume that is awesome so we went as nightmare before Christmas this year my son really wants Tim Burton to do a sequel 
So he was Jack Skellington, and I got to be Sally. Awesome. And, and Michael, you didn't go as anything this year, but we got a throwback <laughs> picture for you. You know, before this is a scandal, I want to point it out, I did not go full Trudeau. I just like Biggie Smalls, and I wore the Gucci sweater. But Bill Thank Cosby liked those sweaters. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thank you for finding a way to make that political. We want to get producer Greg in this uh, as well. Look at him and his, his gorgeous daughter. Uh, Gavin Newsom was a part of the, the Halloween fun uh, as presidential candidates, all of them different Democratic presidential candidates. And I was working, so I accidentally went as Mayor Pete. How about that? <laughs> nice. Hope you all uh, have a happy Halloween with your family. Hope it was a lot of fun. Thanks for watching The Issue Is. We'll see you next week. And near, here's where you get to dance. That's the best part of coming on this show. Let's see it. Let's see your move. Oh, yeah. dear. Really? You yeah. really? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it was good, man.